Hello, everyone. We will start in, I'll give everyone another couple of minutes, another minute or so before we start. We're still waiting for a couple of folks. Okay. okay, we can begin. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Craig Slutskin. I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. This is Manhattan Community Board 5 Parks and Public Spaces Committee. Uh, I am the chairman of the committee. So I want to, again, welcome everybody this evening. We have three items on the agenda for this for tonight. Uh, one item is an informational session and the other two are applications. The way it will work tonight in terms of how we run the meeting is that we'll hear a presentation uh, from an applicant or from the interested party. Uh, we will, the uh, committee will be have the chance to ask questions. Uh, then we will go to the public, and if they want to submit comments or ask their own questions, they may do so. Then we'll go into what's called a business session. During the business session, it's only appropriate for members of the committee uh, to convene and to speak unless uh, otherwise directed by the chair, me. Uh, the committee will discuss uh, the application, and if uh, we are taking a vote, uh, we will take a vote at that time. The vote uh, is not the official position of CB5. We will vote in about a week and a half. That's the second to Thursday of the month. Uh, check cb5.org for details. Uh, that is the full board meeting, and at that point, the full board will take a vote, uh, and then that will become the official position of uh, the community board. Um, so that's what we will go through tonight, and we're going to start off tonight with an information session, we have, we're lucky enough to have three different different parties coming to pre present to us, the Parks Department, the Tran Department of Transportation, as well as our friends over at the Central Park Conservancy, who are going to talk about uh, changes in traffic patterns that they are considering uh, putting in. And I will, uh, I don't know who is leading that discussion, is that you, David, or Mitchell? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll off. Can you introduce everybody who's going to who's uh, speaking on your behalf from Central Park Parks and DOT? Uh, I sure can, and thanks so much, Craig, and everybody else here uh, for giving us this time. Uh, my name is David Saltonstall. I'm the Vice President for Government Relations and Policy at the Central Park Conservancy, which is the nonprofit that uh, manages and operates uh, Central Park. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we're joined here tonight by Mitchell Loring from New York City Parks. Say hi, Mitchell, uh, who's a senior project planner at Parks. And um, I'm not sure if Colleen Chattergoon is here yet. I didn't see her pop up, but maybe she is. Uh, but she is a senior borough planner from the Department of Transportation. Uh, and if she's not here right now, I think she will be along. But um, the reason why we wanted to just come to you is to um, outline uh, for you, uh, a study that we're doing of the, the Central Park Drives, which is the six mile loop road at the center of the park. Um, can I share my screen, Craig, and, and maybe- You should have access to do so. If you don't let me know, but please try. Cause I know you were, you were going to present. Here you go, yep. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, for we see carriage horses and bikes okay. and bikers. Great. Uh, so this is a short, you know, 10 or 15 minute um, presentation that I, I hope will answer all your questions. But if it doesn't, um, then uh, I'm, I'm here to answer some and um, those that might be better directed at DOT or parks. Um, that's why we have Mitchell and Colleen here. Um, so listen, I think all, all of you are probably familiar with Central Park uh, and that it has become uh, a more and more crowded, uh, some would say slightly precarious place in recent years. Um, cars have not been there since 2018, but especially during COVID, 
you know, we just started seeing more people, uh, more electronic vehicles uh, at the south end of the park down by Community Board 5. There have always been horse carriages and pedicabs adding to the, to the density. Um, so we thought it was time to sort of step back and take a real look at how the drives are striped, how they're signaled, how they're laid out um, in the hopes of making them safer for everybody. Um, and hang on, I just need to move something. We really have three uh, goals uh, with this study. Uh, one is really paramount and that is to improve safety. Um, you know, uh, as I said, the park is just getting a little tighter and, and more crowded, especially on weekends. I think anybody who's been out in the park the last couple of weekends really feels that. Uh, and we do that through intelligent design interventions, public outreach, education, really whatever tools we can lay our hands on. Um, we wanna improve mobility and accessibility. Um, so a lot of talk, especially in CB7 and CB8 about how to get across the park, uh, which is more difficult than going north south uh, because especially on bikes, um, it's, it can just be difficult to navigate your way across the park and you're really not supposed to be on the footpaths at the moment if you are a biker, so that makes it hard. Um, and you know we wanna do all that while maintaining the character of the park. I think we all recognize that the park is so special because it feels separate and afar, apart from the city. You know, you can really feel like you are in a natural landscape and we fully intend to keep it that way. Um, we were somewhat moved by uh, some of Frederick Law Olmsted's thinking. Uh, he is the designer of the park. And in 1860, he wrote the below, uh, which had to do, I, I think really about his recognition that, you know, there were always gonna be all kinds of people using the park for all different kinds of things. Uh, and they would be going different speeds and doing, you know, engaged in different activities. And the, and the key was to try and provide for all of them in one way or another. I think the transverse roads are sort of the pinnacle of that in that he figured out a way to get cars through the park in a way that makes them essentially invisible to people who are in the park. Uh, but he talked about, you know, the separation of ways uh, as in parks and parkways for efficiency and amenity of movement and to avoid collision or the apprehension of collision between different kinds of traffic. And I would say the apprehension of the collision is what we are trying to solve for uh, these days. Um, so how are we doing this? Um, we are doing this in coordination with our agency partners, which are principally the DOT and the Parks Department. Uh, that is, you know, it is important to understand the sort of jurisdictional lines here. Central Park Conservancy manages the day-to-day -day maintenance and operation of the park through a contract with the city. Uh, when you see employees in the park cutting the grass or pruning the trees or doing whatever it is uh, needs to happen, those are conservancy employees. Um, but at the end of the day, the Department of Transportation uh, maintains oversight of all the roads, meaning the loop road, the drive, um, how they're configured, how they're striped, when they get paved, uh, all of those things. They are, they are city property and very much under the jurisdiction of the city. And the Parks Department uh, is, the, is the keeper of, of the park and, and the, the regulatory oversight body um, that is uh, responsible for enforcing regulations in the park, whether it's dogs off leash or littering or driving through red lights. Uh, in theory, that is all the domain of the Parks Enforcement Patrol. Um, and that's why they are there. So, you know, to the extent that the whole process is intended to come up with new ideas uh, and new ways of thinking uh, about how the park is laid out, um, these decisions will ultimately rest uh, with city government, with these agencies, with city hall, uh, but the conservancy is 
sort of trying to drive this conversation. And we're doing so in part by having hired uh, an engineering firm, Sam Schwartz, uh, to help us develop ideas and look at data and, and really assess uh, things right down to the, to the street level. Uh, interesting to look back on the history of the drives, you know, for the first 50 years, which is like a third of the life of the park, uh, the drives were a carriage road. Uh, they weren't even paved until 1912 uh, when cars became more prolific. Bikes have always been part of the scene. For as long as there have been bikes, there have been bikes in Central Park. <clears throat> and for a long time, bikes and cars sort of shared the road, uh, especially at the southern end of the park down by you guys, um, up until 2018, when cars were formally banned from the park, uh, which was a great day for the park, um, and ushered in something more like this, um, where you see bikes, you see e-bikes, you see lots of them, you see a bike going in the wrong direction. Um, and really also what you see that's kind of interesting is like, if you look at the road and how it's laid out, it's still laid out as if cars are in there, kind of, you know, if you look at the width of the lanes, those are car lanes. Uh, that signal, you know, was really there from the days when, when cars were there. And I can guarantee you that if that light was red, uh, people would be doing exactly the same thing as they're doing um, right now, because I think um, for better or for worse, a lot of people in the park feel like those signals uh, you know, date back to a time when there were cars in the park and they don't apply to them. Uh, on top of this, there have been a lot of new electrified devices uh, going fast. And mostly we just have an enormous number of people. Um, the park gets 42 million visitors a year. That is more than the top 10 national parks combined. Uh, it's an enormous number of people that have to be managed for. So, I mean, we've started to really dig into some of the intricacies of this road. Again, you know, you, you all are probably pretty familiar with the basic layout, um, you know, but this is the entire loop road. There are 69 pedestrian crossings to contend with. There are 15 entrances uh, that feed, you know, directly into the drives from city streets. And, you know, there are the myriad users uh, that we have talked about already. Uh, and myriad, you know, challenges that I think have been uh, acknowledged uh, for a while now. Um, dedicated lanes don't really serve to segregate users cyclists, from runners, from skaters, from pedestrians. Signals are mostly ignored. Uh, bikers have trouble getting east-west. Uh, the crossings, the you know, pedestrian crossings can be uh, challenging, if not frightening, for seniors, children, the disabled. Uh, emergency vehicles often you know, have a tough time, especially on weekends, getting where they need to be. Uh, enforcement is a constant challenge. Um, Parks Department uh, Enforcement Patrol has faced years of, of budgetary cutbacks. Uh, and, you know, the commercially related users of the drives, pedicabs, horse carriages, um, are not going away. And if anything, are have proliferated in recent years. I think the COVID impact is also there anecdotally, I mean, it's just our sense that, you know, there used to be real peaks at the morning and the evening as people were out and exercising, you know, or doing their thing. Now more people are working from home. And as a result, we see more people at more times of day uh, in the park. Uh, more people are commuting through the park um, as mass transit and commuting patterns have, have changed. And of course there's, um, a lot of e-bikes and stuff. We have started to gather, gather, gather some data. Um, what you're looking at here is crash data at the north end of the park. 
these are fairly serious accidents where 911 was called, police responded, an ambulance responded. Uh, it's four years of data. Um, and, you know, to go down to the south end of the park, um, we were kind of shocked by these, you know, relatively low numbers at the very southern end of the park. Um, we actually went back to the police department and said, like, this has got to be wrong. Like, you know, there's so many people down there. How can this be? Um, and they said, no, it's not wrong. But, you know, what what happens actually is that there, the, the south end of the park is so crowded that it's difficult uh, to really get up ahead of steam down there. And so while there are a lot of minor, I, I guess I would call them fender benders or people bumping into each other, um, they're not the kind of accidents where, where somebody really gets hurt. Um, a clear exception to that rule is at 72nd Street. Um, you see that number 30. Uh, that is actually the, the highest number in the park. And I think for anybody who is familiar with this stretch, you know, the 72nd Street goes is a is a north south as well as an east west crossing. And there's a there's a point if you're going from west to east where you're actually sort of headed up the hill into traffic. And it's an extremely bad recipe uh, for getting hurt. And you know, you see similar things that, you know, this is uh, over by the Delacorte Theater, which is a very busy uh, crossing um, for pedestrians. It's also very much on a downhill, uh, which is the other key thing. Looking again at the north end of the park, you know, these, these red hotspots are in many ways a function of where people can really pick up a head of steam if they're on a, on a wheeled device and crossings are not so good. And that seems to be the common denominator. So, you know, that's just an example of the kind of data we're trying to look at, you know, as we dig down into where the trouble spots are and what can be done to address them. In terms of this process and what we're doing and how we're hoping to go about it, um, you know, we do have a survey up that's on our website and we would urge everybody here and their neighbors to, to take that survey. It's really the best way um, to weigh in and have your voice heard. Um, you know, we got 4,000 responses in the first weekend and, you know, it's, uh, I think, probably double that now. Um, it, you know, everybody has an opinion about Central Park and the best way for us to try and get our arms around it is to is to organize it that way uh, through a survey. There's also an email there if you wanna add longer comments. Um, this, this survey will likely be up until early or mid June. So uh, still plenty of time to take it. Uh, so there is that. And you know we are also just making the rounds. Um, you know, we've had a couple of webinars of our own that we, you know, publicized just through social media where people showed up um, back in the end of March. We uh, are pretty much concluding this round of community board um, gatherings like this. We've been to CB10, we've been to CB8, we've been to seven. Uh, we're here at five tonight. And I think there will be an in-person uh, meeting in the park in June at some point um, as we move further along. Uh, in addition, like, you know, we've met with any group that wants to talk to us, um, uh, whether that's, you know, Bike NYC or Transportation Alternatives or um, members of the dis disability community or uh, birders or, you know, rollerbladers. Like, uh, if anybody represents or is a member of an organization that uses the park and wants to chat with us, uh, we're happy to sort of go through this um, with them. In terms of where we end up, you know, like I, I, I think it's, you know, we are we are genuinely open-minded right now about what the mix of solutions are going to be. And we very much want everything to be on the table. That's signage, that's, you know, how the roadways are organized. It could even be surface materials. 
Um, you know, there's nothing that says the entire drive has to be paved. Um, it's looking at new ways to get across the park, lighting, signalization has come a long way uh, in recent years, traffic calming stuff, as well as, you know, soft infrastructure, which is, you know, policies and education, enforcement. Um, in terms of our timeline, we sort of kicked this off, you know, late February, uh, we're spending the spring in this process of gathering feedback, talking to folks, listening. Uh, Sam Schwartz is compiling lots of data, which includes looking at other parks around the country and around the world, other cities, to see how they are dealing with the whole pedestrian biker uh, challenge. Uh, in the summer, we'll have one open house, but then, you know, I think we'll probably spend some months just trying to arrive at some preferred recommendations for changes to the drive. Uh, and in the fall slash winter, we're going to come back to you and, um, you know, have a much more specific conversation about interventions that we are considering and and you know honestly those are the community board meetings that might generate more <laughs> more interest um, more attendees uh, as we start to drill down on specific solutions uh, that hopefully will be embraced um, by the city and everybody else um, you know at the end of the day, Central Park is a is a shared space, you know, and we're really trying to drive that idea that while everybody, you know, lots of people might go there for one specific reason, uh, you know, part of its amazingness is just that it's a it's a cross section of New Yorkers, and it is as diverse uh, as New York in terms of the things people like to do there, and. Um, we want to protect everybody's right to do their own thing there. And we also want to create a, a, a real roadmap for, for future changes. Uh, we'd like to think this study could be of value to other parks, not just in the city, uh, but around the world. A, a lot of parks do actually care about what Central Park does at the end of the day in terms of its management and it, how it you know, preserves its history uh, while also moving forward at the same time. So, um, you know, we want to leave behind a legacy that actually uh, means something at the end of the day. So that's really it. That's why we are um, here today, really just to give you an overview of what we're doing, uh, encourage everybody to, to take the survey. Um, and if you have questions, um, we'd be glad to, to take them. Thank you, thank you, David. The first thing is on the survey. Could you put the survey link in the chat for us? I think that would be helpful. And if the board office, Mike or Marisa, if you could put it for the attendees as well, because I don't know if that, David can, but if you can put that in the chat. And yeah. Marisa, we should talk about whether we can put this in the weekly uh, email that goes out uh, so they, they get more even more exposure. We yeah. have we have put it in our newsletters for the last two okay. cycles or so. I didn't do that. So I, I, before we go to my committee, I, I do have two questions. Um, the, the first is, does this affect the, I guess they call the, I mean, that might be what's called the transverses, which is when you, you're not going through the park, I mean, you're going basically under the park from one side of Central Park driving to the other side. It's, you're not actually going through like the trees, it's just sort of a, a road. Does this affect that? If you're going like a 96, West 96 to East 96, you know, you yeah. go sort of down and that's, the, is that the, is that what's called the trans, is that what's called? Yes, you know, yep. and they're at 69th and 79th and 86th and 96th. Right. And um, it may, you, you, you know, uh, one of the open questions that we are spending some time trying to evaluate is whether the transverses um, could be made safe 
for bikers. Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend any bikers or pedestrians going down there now. People people do, uh, but you know they're fairly tight spaces with cars and buses. There are sidewalks down there. Um, yeah. So uh, you know it's it's quite conceivable that there is enough space to make to put bike lanes on the transverses. Um, you know, ultimately that's a question for, for DOT. Um, but we do think it would provide some measure of uh, a solution because, you know, not everybody is going to Central Park to go to Central Park. A, a lot of people are just trying to get from one place to another and the park happens to be in the middle. Um, they're trying to get across. And putting those folks on the transverses would be quick for them and also relieve pressure um, on the drives. And then my second question, and I know it's not really germane to this discussion, but I still am, am just curious if you have a, a thought on this or are there any updates. On the horse-drawn carriages, I think you made the comment there here, is there any movement on banning them, from banning them, changing what... The, the, re, the regulations around them. So I know that's been a, a, a source of contention for many years. I mean, I know going back to when de Blasio was running for mayor, that was something that he was a key, key part of his campaign. And that was, you know, several nine, nine or 10 years ago. Is there any talk about that anymore? Or is that sort of, we are where we are and it's not being changed anytime soon? I mean, my response to that is mostly just as a you know New Yorker who reads the newspapers. Um, you know, my sense is that uh, Mayor Adams takes a different view, uh, is not uh, necessarily committed to banning horses the way uh, Mayor De Blasio said he was, but um, did not ultimately accomplish. Um, whether there are horses in the park or not is entirely up to the city, uh, and I right. would say, you know almost exclusively up to the mayor, given the, the politics of the whole thing. Sure. Um, so uh, there is a bill, I think, in the city council that would ban horses. It's been in the city council for uh, years. Uh, and, you know, last I checked, uh, it did not have um, the kind of support that would be needed to pass a bill. So, um, you know, I think that's just sort of my, my layman's yeah assessment Understood. of where we are. Okay, understood, thank you. Uh, Samir, I'll turn the, the, you have a question it looks like. Yeah, um, so I know you said that it could impact the transverses that are obviously sort of in the park and sort of not. But one thing I've heard uh, from people who do ride bikes is that, especially on the south end, where you see a lot of people going uh, the wrong way, it's because there's no bike lane on 59th. Uh, you know, I hear similar things on the east side because there's no bike lane on, on the east side outside of the park. So people go mm -hmm. inside. Um, is that out of scope or is that something you would consider like giving also a recommendation to the DOT, DOT basically saying like, help us get these people going the wrong way uh, out of the park and like give them somewhere else to go? Yeah, uh, very much so. I mean, you know, we are going to advocate for things like a bike lane down Fifth Avenue. Uh you know, Central Park West has a bike lane um, and it does take a lot of pressure off the park. Uh, the east side actually really has no way to bike south, you know, downtown because uh, even within the park, the drive goes north on the east side. Um, so, you know, a bike lane somewhere on the east side that went south would really be enormously helpful and if it were up to us, it would be on Fifth Avenue. Uh, I know that's a lift, uh, you know, and probably would not be extremely popular um, on Fifth Avenue, but I don't know. It, that I, I think you can look at Central Park West and say that, um, you know, the character of that avenue has very much been maintained and people like the bike lane and it works. Um, there are more buses on Fifth Avenue, which I think does make it a slightly different beast than Central Park West. Um, but we are absolutely, I think, to answer your question, you know, trying to look at this whole thing holistically. And that includes, you know, looking at how people might use other roads around the park um, in a responsible fashion. Great, thank you. 
Yeah, and Samir, it's Colleen from DOT. How are you? Um, Hi, I just want to add that whatever outcome the study produces, you know, DOT will be more than happy to take a look at that, whether it's, you know, adding additional bike lanes at a particular quarter, we'll, we'll study that as well. And we'll work with the Conservancy and Parks. Thank you, Colleen. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Colleen. Uh, any other questions from the committee? Uh, any questions from the public? We have an opportunity to ask questions. Charles, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, Hi. Welcome to uh, CB5. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a blind person living here in New York City. And um, I was wondering uh, two quick things. Would it be possible to have like a tactile guideway strip um, on some of the, uh, or all of the uh, paths through, uh, going through Central Park and maybe with, um, areas of uh, maybe like kind of like a shape to let a blind person know whereabouts in the park they are uh, because you know it's you know out of all the parks Central Park is very important and for someone who's blind who doesn't have family or friends or any type of assistant to take uh, me personally into the park and I feel there are other, other people in the blind community who live alone or who are older and they just don't have anyone to uh accompany them to the park. I'm just wondering if there's some sort of way to make this very important park accessible. As, as we know, a lot goes on in the park. There's a lot of music events, there's a lot of things happening. There's so many things I would like to go to, like Shakespeare in the park, things like that. And I miss out on them because I don't have anyone mm -hmm. to help me. And the other point is I'm wondering if that can't be done. I'm wondering, and I know uh, Central Park doesn't have enough uh, volunteers or assistance to help because I've called the uh, Central Park Conservancy before uh, about uh, help. Um, but I'm wondering, could there be some sort of database of regular New Yorkers, maybe some who are retired, some who are, um, you know, have, have the time to sign up to be like, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be on this database. If, if uh, someone who's uh, disabled, who needs that extra help, uh, they, they could, uh, somehow the Conservancy could put them together. And maybe as an incentive, maybe they could have maybe a discount to some, program that the park does or, or something like that to do that because I, um, there's this app for the blind called Be My Eyes and it um, it pairs a blind person with a uh, sighted person through the phone and it's sort of like crowdsourcing like that. So I was inspired by that idea to say, well, couldn't we have some New Yorkers who love walking in the park and spend a lot of time in the park to say, hey, would you mind helping someone with a disability, you know, if, 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 if it occurs where someone with a disability wants to go to park, spend time in the park, could maybe they be matched with someone like that. But I do hope that something, some sort of improvement can be done there because, uh, you know, I miss out a lot going to that park. And um, I feel like with the other business improvement districts helping me, uh, as, it, as this uh, community board knows, um, I've been helped a lot by Bryant Park and Times Square and other conservancies such as Madison Square Park. I'm hoping that Central Park could, you know, also join in that sort of you know, improving uh, accessibility to people who just don't have anyone to accompany them. And uh, thank you, thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thank you so much for that suggestion. Uh, you know, I think it's an amazing idea. Um, we have thousands of volunteers, most of whom dig in the dirt and rake leaves and things like that, but they're very dedicated folks uh, and it may be that there's a place for that. And, you know, in terms of, um, you know, strips that uh, might be more tactile or, um, you know, signals that might be more dynamic than the existing ones, um, that would certainly be our hope. I, I don't know if Colleen would add to that in terms of, you know, what's required today when you put in a new, crosswalk, I would assume that that's fairly standard um, treatment, but I, I don't know the answer to that question. Thank you. Charles, was your hand up for something else or? Oh, yes. I just wanted to um, just uh, give some clarification on what I meant. I do apologize. I don't mean the uh, tactile curb cuts. I mean, like, if there was a way that there could be a tactile strip going along uh, the pathways 
of the cent- uh. of Central Park where a blind person could just simply follow it, you know, what you know, so they could walk along the, the path and just use their cane and tap along that long, long strip that would just like take them in either direction or, or through mm-hmm. the different paths. That's that's what I meant. I don't know if that would be too challenging or I just meant like that. Sorry. Okay. Uh, I understand. Uh, we will definitely throw that into the mix of ideas. Um, and Charles, if there's a way for me to uh, follow up with you, I'd be I'd be happy to do that. Maybe um, CB5 can provide uh, your contact information. Yeah, we uh, the board office has it, and and so Marisa can connect the two of you. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the committee or from the public? Okay, so David, Mitchell, Colleen, thank you so much for coming in. We do appreciate it. I do have the presentation as well. Uh, And uh, we do look forward to hearing from you and we will continue to publicize the survey. And hopefully members of the committee, you can take the survey today or tonight as well, if you haven't already. Thank you so much. And yeah, we uh, we look forward to coming back to you, uh, you know, in a few months when we have some specific recommendations. Great, thank you. We look forward to that. All right, thanks again. Thank you all. Have a good, have a good evening. So our, we're gonna move along to the next application, the next item on the agenda, which is an application. Both of the applications we're gonna hear are actually repeat ones for those of you who were on the committee last year, they will look very familiar. Uh, the first one we'll go through is the application from Bryant Park Corp uh, in, in association with the MSG for the Knicks and the Rangers watch parties in mid to late May. Uh, John, you were the lead on this with Aiden who could not be here tonight. Do you have any comments before we go? Um, to the Brian, our friends at Brian Park. No, uh, just just that it's very similar to last year's event. Um, it will be in Brian Park. Um, the only difference is last year um, the proposal was to have um, upwards of two viewing events for uh, the Rangers uh, who were in the playoffs. This year, it's the proposal is two events: one for the New York Knicks and one for the New York range is conditional upon them making it to the third round. And I'll ask you as a football and baseball fan, what are their chances of getting to the third round? Because I, I do, I can tell you about the Jets, I can tell you about the Yankees. I can't tell you about the Knicks or the Net, the Knicks or the Rangers, I'm sorry. Well, as a diehard Knicks fan, I'm, I'm gonna say, um, <laughs> hopefully yes, though the first, their first game on Sunday was disappointing. I'll put it okay. that way. Okay. okay. They lost at home, which is not okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll let. Um, I do follow hockey, but I'll let one of my colleagues who's. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll we'll let Michael talk. Though, about though that. they're they are they did make it to the um to the to the um to the seventh game, so okay. Uh, both look exactly. um you know reasonably good. Okay. So uh, I guess Michael, are you going to be presenting this or? Uh, Freya? Yeah, I think we can kind of do it in conjunction. Thank sure. you. Sure. Do you want to introduce yourselves to the committee? Sure. Um, I'm Freya Gran. I'm the Senior Vice President of Events and Liberal Relations for Madison Square Garden. And I'm Michael Sine, and I am a Senior Manager of Government Affairs and Social Impact at uh, Madison Square Garden. Um, and yes, we were able to present to you all last year and are fortunate to be in the position of having both of our teams in the playoffs this year. So the Knicks have made it through to the second round. They have their second game of the second round tomorrow night at MSG, and then Rangers play tonight in New Jersey, which is game seven of the first round. So we'll know today, tonight, if they've made the second round. But as John mentioned, we would propose doing these uh, viewing parties if we were to be fortunate enough to get through to round three, which sort of sits in the window of mid to late May. We unfortunately don't know the dates till all of the games are decided, um, but that that's sort of the window. And then round four, which is the which is the finals, the Stanley Cup finals and the NBA finals, would be the first two weeks of June. Um, but again, as John said, this sorry is to the- interrupt you. Just to, just to clarify for the committee, mm-hmm. so you're asking for for one of each team for round three, and one of each team for potentially round four as well. It's a total of four. 
Yes, exactly. I just want to make sure we, we know what we're yep, being asked. Totally. Okay, yeah. thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, not at all. Um, and as, uh, yeah, as John said, I'll share my screen. We did do these last year. We had an amazing turnout and I think a really positive experience uh, with fans kind of all coming together. It's predominantly a viewing party. Last year we did use the screen that was already up for the Bryant Park movies, but we would be bringing in our own mobile stage and screen due to the fact that the timing doesn't work for us to use Bryant Park's screen. And then on the kind of front, and Kelly, jump in if I'm using the incorrect words, but the the terrace, the, the page. They'd be, they'd be using the upper terrace for their stage. Thank you. And then... At the front of the park, we've done some sort of fan activations like this bubble hockey, you know, having the player cutouts there for people to do um, to do photo ops with. And this is very similar on the Knicks and the Rangers, the similar, the same footprint we would use. Um, so this was just a recap of what we did last year and we would be following a really similar timeline. Um, and... If, if we were approved for both teams, but this is what it looks like last year. Um, and all the excitement. <laughs> um, and just generally the taglines of the teams are really about being out in the community and supporting New York. So the Rangers playoff tagline and all our whole year campaign has been no quit in New York and the Knicks is New York forever. So it's really about having a free event for the community getting people to come together in a beautiful location and support the team and kind of come together as one as one fan base. So we did a playoff palooza in 30 on the 34th Street Herald Square Plaza to kick off the playoffs, which was really well attended and I think a really nice way for us to be celebrating that these two New York teams are in the playoffs, which is exciting. Um, these are some of just the activations. Um, that we have going around the city as well. They've been out in various different locations. Um, and I have a better floor plan, but I think that was all submitted. So I don't know if anyone needs us to go over the footprint or anything. So, sorry, are you, are you yeah. was that? Okay. So before I go to my committee for questions, so you asked for the total four. Let's say the Knicks advance to round three, the Rangers don't. Are you going to then do two Knicks? And those are you asking for four in total? It might be two Rangers, two Knicks. It might be three Rangers, two, you know, three yeah. Rangers, one, I think one Knicks. What is, yeah, I think we would really plan to just do one per team per round. Having yeah. said that, I could imagine in the, if we were to be in the finals, there would could be an appetite to do two in that fourth round. If but but we would have whatever you guys feel comfortable approving, we would be and what and what fits with the availability of dates at Bryant Park. Yeah, I mean my, my sense is if we get if you get to the play the, the final rounds, that's mid-June, I guess. Yeah, so mid you to mid -June, June, June, yeah. Yeah, so come to our June meeting and we can okay, great. figure out what makes sense then. If that's okay with you, Kelly. I think that's yeah, just, I have I have no problem with that. Um, not a problem. Talk about the first. I will be attending the June meeting for another activation anyway, so I'll be here. I'm sure you will. That's perfectly <laughs> fine. Um, I guess, uh, Kelly, I'll just throw it back at you. Do, were there any issues last year at the park that came up when we had these? To my knowledge, no. I think the event was uh, really successful. I think the community really enjoyed it. Um, I think, you know, going forward with these events, we're, you know, hoping to work closely with the MSG team to make sure, you know, security is tight, make sure the park is, you know, clean before, during, and after. Um, and obviously we have a new stage coming in. It's a little bit different than what we did last year. They, you know, used our stage, used our screen. Um, so we're working closely with their production team to ensure, um, you know, what they're bringing in from an outside vendor will work in the park, um, both aesthetically and, you know, from a production standpoint. But um, yeah, I think overall it was a, it was a really positive event and, you know, we're looking forward to potentially hosting another one this year. Could you remind me how it worked last year and if there's any changes this year, how it worked with alcohol? 
I will let Freya speak to that. <laughs> yeah, we don't have um, any alcohol in the park and we bag check and for, for the viewing parties this year, we've been bag checking and wanding. So we would carry that through to, to Bryant Park, which is what we did last year. We did our VIP kind of experience at the small restaurant cafe there. We're talking with them as well as Bryant Park Brill about so any alcohol consumption would be in, in those locations. Just to clarify, she's referring to the porch. Yeah, that's that's what I figured she was talking about. Um, okay. Uh, does anybody on the committee have any questions? Uh, yeah. John, that sounds like you do. Yeah, yeah. Just, just a couple of clarifications. Can you speak to um, where the where VIP uh, section will be and how it may differ from last year? And also, could you talk a little bit more about the stage? I understand it may be on wheels. It may be uh, a double decker. It's going to be clearly, uh, it looks like facing the opposite direction of it did last year. If you could just speak a little bit more about those elements, please. On the VIP experience, um, we would either use the porch or the or Bryant Park Grill to host those VIP portions. We wouldn't, re we might carve out a small area of the lawn, um, but it would be really minimal. We'd be keeping any VAP experiences to those um, those venues. Um, if, if I could just jump in, I'd heard earlier from one of your colleagues that you were thinking about a double-decker stage and the VIP people would be sort of looking down on the stage. That, that idea has been uh, dispensed with at this I point. I think we're just, Kelly, and correct me if I'm wrong, like I think we're just working through like the specs of that um, and whether that would work work in the space, but like working closely on making sure it's the right size and the right weight, and it's not going to have any impact. But we have used those in the past in the past before, not at Brian Park, but for other events. Correct. Yes, we actually had a walkthrough today with a stage vendor for the MSG team. Um, there is a potential that the double decker stage could be coming in for the event. Um, based on some site plans that I've seen, it looks like that stage may still work in our location. We'll still need to uh, touch base with the folks at Bryant Park Grill and our other team members to ensure that um, you know the load in load out goes successfully, but um, it is definitely still an option on our end. Okay, Craig, I just have a few other um, questions. Um, uh, sound, sound wise, uh, last year you committed to stop uh, sound at 10 and afterwards it would be on personal devices. Uh, are you committing to do the same this year? Yeah, we have the same plan and we direct people, we message that in advance and we um, direct people to have the app so that they can be listening to the to the radio feed. Great. And can you speak to additional sponsors other than MSG and what sort of um, advertising signage so far merchandise would be connected? Um, I guess with, with your organization, but also any co-sponsors you have? Sure. Our main... Um sponsor for the teams is Chase. So we have in the past and what worked I think well last year was just we have their logo kind of like locked up in our logo and in the viewing party logo. So it's really minimal. Um, the overarching branding is Knicks or Rangers, but we have with success last year, I think we're able to kind of brand some of the activations and the staging pieces with some of our key sponsors, which are mainly Chase, Delta, Duncan. They're the kind of main ones who are activating. Um, so, but there's no just singular branding of a part of a sponsor. It would be something locked up with the Knicks or Rangers logo. Okay. And is FanFest more or less the same time as last year? Yeah, our plan was to just start that at three o'clock um, as we did last year. Okay. Pending the game times, yeah. But. All right, and finally, um, can you speak about um, will you be uh, taking uh, pictures of people, photos, videos? Um, if so, in what context and and uh, what sort of um, 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 
will you be giving uh you know sort of proper notice uh to 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 the public about that yeah so last year we and we would i think do again this year is anyone coming onto the lawn is signing a waiver um that speaks to some of the photo and the video and letting them know that um, so we limited any photography to kind of that area or in and around the activations where they're also signing that waiver. All right. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm finished. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Any questions from the public? No questions from the public. Okay. Uh, let's go into business session. Uh, so, how do we feel about this? Any comments? Well, uh, I, it sounds it, almost identical to last year, and right. uh, so, I, I, given that we approved it last year, I, I personally have no problems with it being approved again uh, this year. Last year, if you may recall, a lot of our discussion um, was around. Uh, V, VIP and the possible um, uh, alcohol usage within VIP, but that issue uh, was addressed last year. Doesn't yeah. seem to be an issue this year. And the other issue was sound, and that was addressed by having personal devices uh, being used yeah. after 10 p.m. So, um, and it seems like they have adequate security uh, and, and maintenance on sites. Um, and um, it, the same the same hours it, from set up to completely taking you know down all the equipment and uh, and structures afterwards seems to be the same. So from my standpoint, I'm comfortable with it. Thank you, David. Yeah, I would just like to point out that this is a good bit of boosterism for the city itself. That most of the cities, when their sports team make it that far. They have something going on. And fortunately, uh, New York City is a nice, peaceful, quiet organization. We don't run around like some of the mobs we've seen. So I think this is a fine way to do it. I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, Aaron. So oh. I, I support it. Um, I would just say, though, I think there's been a, rec a recent challenge with you know, incredibly rowdy behavior because of social media with TikTok and YouTube. I, I, these things usually go well in New York, but I would say that there's the tide is turning. So there really needs to be, you know, a plan to deal with that. And it sounds like there is, but, you know, those things sort of come up by, they really surprise you. And, and I would say that there's just more and more, unfortunately, incentive to do that. So I, I urge uh, that we do everything we can to sort of, be prepared for the worst because uh, you you don't really expect it until it happens. So, thank you, uh, Samir. Yeah, just to echo what some of the other folks have said, I'm completely on board, especially because it's very similar to last year. Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, I would I would just echo what what um, Dave said. I think it's it's good for for pride for the city. It's always exciting when we have these our, our teams uh, making the playoffs, uh, and it does bring bring people together. Um, so I think it's exciting that we we can have it, and I'm actually fine with having the, the extra days, you know, because it's, it's two teams. Um, again, I would like you to come back if they make well when they make the final round. Not say if, but when they make the final round, and we can uh, work on that. But uh, just you know, we should we should plan ahead for uh, for the June meeting. Absolutely. So, um, John, do you want to make a motion? Yeah, uh, before I do that, I just want to be clear. The motion is for four events. Is that four nights? That's what we're saying, right? Four of you, okay. Perfect. So um, I uh, make a motion that we uh, approve um, watch party for uh, four events, uh, two for uh, the Knicks and two for the Rangers. Second. Okay. Second. Okay. Uh, since uh, Kim's not here, I'll do the vote. I'm a yes, Dave. Yes. Miriam? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Aaron? Yes. John? Yes. Mike? Yes. Mir? Yes. And that's it. Everybody else is out. Well, motion passes. Uh, good luck. Good luck tonight.
Thank you. Yes, fingers Thank crossed. Uh, Thank, Thank you all so much. We really Good appreciate day. it. Thank you. Thanks, go Rangers. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank Craig, you. will you be able to fill out an additional questionnaire for June meeting? If if it gets to it, just use the same questionnaire and just put put a note date, you know, new dates or updates. You don't have to redo the whole. Will thing. do. I don't want to make. And just to confirm, because I saw on the schedule that the meeting for next month is on a Thursday instead of a Monday. Because Monday is Memorial Day. Right. Just wanted to just wanted you, to confirm. If you would like to come in on, if you would like to zoom in on Memorial Day, you're more than welcome to. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, it's birthday weekend, no, so I don't Thursday, Thursday because of the holiday. <laughs> Thursday because of the holiday. That's why. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And then the final application for this evening is another return. It's the bounce house uh, that we saw last year. Uh, and Samir are you, or Catherine, are you going to introduce it? I don't know. Or yeah, I can. I can introduce it because um, I spoke to them earlier today. Uh, and then maybe if they have a presentation or some materials, which I believe we talked about earlier today, they can present those. Uh, so yeah, there was this event. It was there last year. It, it was this bounce house uh, that obviously the applicants will talk a little bit more about. Um, they're asking to run it for eight weeks. Um, I believe it's basically all of August, sorry, all of July and all of August, primarily uh, for kids because uh, it's a bounce, bounce house. Uh, last year it was run, uh, I think a little bit later, it was one month in August and then a break in September and then another month in October um, or October to November. Um, and this year they want to do the eight weeks, eight weeks in a row. Um, what else is interesting? Um, there were no complaints last year from people using the space otherwise. Um, the stated um, goal of said bounce house is both to activate the space, but also discourage people from selling um, unlicensed um, cannabis products in the park. Uh, and that apparently was a success because it was reduced significantly, but they can talk about that as well. Um, and yeah, so looking forward to hear what else they have to say, and then we can get into questions and all that kind of stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Samira. So, Rachel, I guess you're presenting with Alex. Is that correct? Yeah, Alex is here from Excel Events. Um, <laughs> this is, is, you know, their event that we are hosting and that we sort of partnered with them to initially create. But I'll let Alex show. She might have some pictures or a site plan to talk through. And then I'm happy to answer any questions about how it went last year and, and why it's coming back. Perfect. Um, yeah, I'll share my screen here. Um... Are you, yeah, let me see here. Are you able to see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, perfect. Um, yeah, just a couple of key points. Um, like Samir already mentioned, um, we are looking to run from the 30th of June through the, the 3rd of September. So roughly eight weeks um, in one go. Um, and then just like last year, it's um, an immersive experience. It's the same inflatable. It's the same event. Um, there will be free tickets again for the um, neighboring community members, um, just to encourage everyone to come and check it out and, um, you know, not have to pay for it. Um, and um, like Sami already mentioned, this event is created to target um, families and young kids and to make Greeley um, Square Plaza an attractive community area. Um, so let me just... Jump here. So here's just a rough overview where you can see um, kind of like an overhead how the inflatable kind of um, runs parallel to the park and it's in the um, Greeley Square Plaza. Um, this is the more detailed site map, um, which I'm happy to share with anybody who um, needs it. Um, it really just just more of the um, detailed rendering of um, how exactly it's set up and how it fits in. As you can see, we don't block the fire lane um, and we are not actually in the park. Um, so we're just in the plaza um, parallel to the park. Um, here's a couple of pictures from last year. So obviously I know last year my colleague um, Cami presented um, with lots of renderings, but we didn't have any photos yet. Uh, this year we can present some photos to just share with you um, what this all looked like. So as you can see, it's a um, colorful, 
and um, happy family friendly um, activation. Um, here's a couple of photos more of the uh, from a little further away, how you can see how it kind of fit into the area. Um, and then this is what it looks like on the inside. Um, it's very creative, very unique. It's designed with lots of balls and um, as you can see snow and um, disco balls. I mean, it's just supposed to be a fun interactive experience, very immersive. Um, it takes about 25 minutes to just kind of slowly make your way through, through the inflatable tunnel pretty much. Um, here's some more. Um, and um, yeah, I had a video, but I think, um, and then um, Samir asked for a couple of um, sample signage that will be um, on site. I've already explained to him, we won't have any sponsor signage there. Um, so we won't have any um, outside sponsors apart from the actual event brand itself. Um, so here you can see the red one is just a sample of like a barricade cover. Um, we'll have a couple of different colors, but this is the the rough idea. Um, pretty simple, just with our logo on it. Um, the green one is a sample of the um, fencing signage. Um, so we have some fence up just to make sure nobody gets into the back of house areas. Um, and it'll be covered by, again, there might be a couple of different colors, but that's the general idea of the design. And then we have a couple of signs out with house rules um, and how to safely enjoy the activation. So it's everything is pretty straightforward um, and there won't be any other sponsors or any other branding um, on site. Um, and that's really it. That's pretty straightforward. Um, if you let me let me know if you want me to go back to any other to any of the photos yeah. or renderings. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to any answer any additional questions. Thank you. So I, I actually have a couple of yeah. questions and, and, and comments, but um, first, I may be the only one with the possible exception of Aaron, who also has young kids, who actually was in the bouncy castle, bouncy house last year. So I went through it. So mm -hmm. uh, it is a fun experience. The one thing I will say is I really do think you need more agent safety agents or whatever you want to call it inside. And the right. reason why is because in the with where you have all of the balls, they go very high. And if you have a child who's not very tall, they could very easily get stepped on and lost in the ball pit. And I say this as someone who rescued a child whose parents were no, no not watching them. Um, it's just very easy because the balls get really, they go through uh, three, they go up as far as three feet, I think, in some places. I remember from last year. So that's just one suggestion. Um, to you. I mean, it was a really, my son loved it and it was a great time. Um, the uh, qu question I have, and this might be more a Rachel question. So last year, based upon feedback from this committee, you broke it up into two pieces. And I think that was a lot from, a lot of it came from this committee because we had feedback from the public that they were losing really square where a lot of people happen to sit during the day and not at night, but at, dur during the day. And, and I get why you have this. It's not only just a fun and immersive event, but it was also serving another purpose as to sort of utilize that space and reserve that space for, you know, a different, a different uh, element, I guess I would say. Um, number one is, if I remember correctly from last year, you still had the same number of chairs. They would just disperse in other areas, I think. And remind me if I'm misremembering. Is that the same this year? And number two is why are you going back to trying to do it eight weeks without breaking it up? So basically that, that section, which is a nice section, it's an open section, that section is unavailable for basically the entire summer. Yeah. Um, so I'll do uh, them in reverse order. I think First, I'll address the duration question. I believe when we first came to you last year, it was actually originally a 12 week. 12 weeks, right. It was 12 weeks. It was longer. So we definitely yeah, heard you on the overall length and don't think 12 weeks is an appropriate time length. I think, um, you know, reducing it was, was definitely intended to get to that. Um, in terms of not breaking it up, I think we learned last year that these things take a little time to get off the ground from a PR and just knowledge perspective, people knowing that it's there. Um, and we found that 
by the time we were really hitting our stride in terms of people actually visiting, knowing about using, AKA making it worth it both financially and from a visitation, you know, busyness in the area perspective to actually take up all that space, it wouldn't have been worth it if we had it sitting vacant. Um, and we found that it, it took a couple of weeks for it to really, you know, hit its stride. And then by that time we were taking it down. Um, and then we had the same problem on phase two. It took a couple of weeks for people to realize it was there and then it was time for it to go away. So um, just in the interest of making it actually uh, at something that draws new visitors to the neighborhood and keeps the area busy, it wasn't functioning well in two chunks. Um, so that's one, two, it's intended pretty squarely to overlap with school vacation. Um, so I know that Excel events is trying to, um, hit as much of the school vacation as they can, because that's obviously their target audience as kids. Um, and as for the people who enjoy Greeley Square, it's what you said, we are going to definitely still have the same amount of seating. We'll distribute it to the other public spaces in the area, uh, to Greeley Park, to Herald Square, to the little plaza north of it that has the ping pong tables. Um, and I think generally 34th Street partnerships approach to these public spaces are we, we don't really like completely follow unmanaged public spaces anyway. I think when we have um, public spaces that have seating, we're also trying to do programming. We're also trying to have concerts. We're also we're really trying to do stuff all the time and um, stretching our budget to do as much stuff in as many places as we can. So this frankly also helps us kind of concentrate all of the concerts and things um, so that we always have something going on everywhere, which in this part of Midtown is necessary to keep conditions, um, you know, safe and, and attractive. Yep. Um, just on the timing, one, one response to your comment, you do wind up losing with this timing, you lose people who leave for the summer. Now, I don't know if that, right, because school's not there. And if they go to sleepaway camp, you lose that. Now, you're never going to have perfect dates because there are positives and negatives to each day. I, I get that. And I don't know if you don't need to comment. You don't want to. But, you know, it's just something to consider because you're you're losing no matter, you know, you gain and lose no matter what date. But again, there's no perfect answer to that. Yeah, we we found that August was much more successful than October. So that's frank. That's why we chose yeah. Why August thinking that that was the defining, uh, you know, interest group for us. Yeah. And then the one last thing I do want to mention, we tried last year, I think Rachel, you and I had spoken about it to try to get some of the, uh, to, to get tickets to schools, which may or may not, which may not work because it's the summer for some of the, there is temporary housing by right by you right now. And we can work with, you know, as you said, with community partners to make sure those tickets you know get distributed to families who, who would really, really be, uh, would really like to see, have the experience. So, and I think what we need to do is we need to do it earlier. Cause I think last year we sort of got on this too late and then we lost a lot of kids that might've, might've enjoyed it. So, but we have time for that. Yeah, that totally agree. I think when you came up with that idea last summer, I was, I think it was really exciting. Cause it was, I think the way you phrased it was let's bring some joy to some people who could really use some joy. So absolutely. And um, let's do that again. Uh, so let's go to my committee. Uh, I think Catherine, your hand might have been up first. So let's start with you. Yes. So I'm presenting with Samir. And so I just wanted to, um, I can share my screen for just one moment because I think a picture is worth a thousand words. I saw this application last year for the first time. And so um, I don't know if you can see my screen. So those are my photos. This, these are, this is my photo of this phase. And I just wanted to point out the reason why I put this up is because it is about the juxtaposition. If you can see the tables there um, in the park still there, and then the bounce houses in the side, side. And I think that this is important because it does not disrupt the growing vibrancy that we're seeing in the park area where people are out sitting and enjoying the outdoor space. It does not interrupt, and I guess I was saying happy spring in the one below. I also just wanted to, um, we didn't exactly take this through the matrix, but I did sit with things that we consider. And again, I just think it's important to talk about the juxtaposition that DOT is a, a partner in this project with you all. Um, and that that whole spring, that it does not, um, it does not interrupt Greeley Square, which is what the concern had been last year and is obviously, you know, the ongoing part. It is a uniquely creative activation um, for the area. 
Um, and again, I just want to follow up. There isn't going to be a lot of loud music playing or anything like that. And I do want you to talk a little bit about hours because you're going to be open until 9 p.m. at night, which seems late for little people. But in the summertime, anything is possible in New York City. So if you could just comment on the hours, that would be um, helpful. Yeah, Alex, do you want to take hours and sound? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so the hours um, last year, what we did is we um, actually adjusted the hours as we went. So if we feel like the um, you know 9 p.m. finish is not visited well, then we're happy to adjust that as well. Um, as we are targeting mainly kids, we do we did see a lot of um, young adults as well. So um, we're hoping that we can have a lot of the kids and families come throughout the day and then have the young adults come at night. That way we don't have an overlap, you know, kids us, it's just a safer experience for both groups. Um, and um, yeah, so we're hoping that um, it will be busy uh, during all hours. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, we're happy to adjust if we feel like it's not, you know, not successful or um, bring in the wrong crowds in the evening. Um, that's certainly something that um, we can um, review as we go. Um, and then regarding sound, um, I'm glad to hear that um, there wasn't a lot of sound disruption. And um, I believe there was a couple of notes from last year um, about having um, no speakers on the outside and just speakers on the inside. So we are adjusting that for this year. Um, um, so there should be be um very minimal um very minimal um yeah sound disruption from this activation thank you uh, dave dave yeah um if you could just speak briefly to the idea of sanitation what will be happening around the installation itself and also, I'm curious, knowing that young children are really germ buses, <laughs> how you're going to be sanitizing the inside of this operation once it's up and running? Yes, that's a very good question. So for the outside, um, we are um, going to have local um, staff, local labor to kind of help keep the area clean. And then we will schedule um, junk pickups um, regularly so that everything around the inflatable is or the activation is clean since we don't sell food or really anything um last year we've experienced that there was not a lot of extra trash um but obviously um we'll make sure that we have regular trash pickups to make sure that nothing accumulates and um you know um stays in the area um, and for the inside, um, we do a lot of these, like not this specific one, but we do a lot of bounce house events with ball pits and um, well, just bouncy houses and kids. So um, we have um, equipment and <laughs> techniques to clean inflatable ball pit balls. Um, it's a tedious task, but it needs to get done because like you said, kids are um, germ bombs. So um, the inside of the inflatable will be cleaned regularly, um, daily, and um, including the ball pits. And we'll use um, non-toxic materials just because we know that the kids will touch and then put in their mouths, put the, the hands in their mouths. Um, so it will be, everything will be non-toxic um, and everything will be um, disinfected um, regularly so that um, we reduce the risk of any, any transmissions um, as much as we can. Okay, thank you. Mike. I have a comment and two questions. Can I do all three? Can I bundle it? You can bundle, go ahead. Uh, my comment is, um, last year I visited several times, and although I was dismayed at the size of this thing, when I first saw it, when I got to know it, I kind of liked it, so I'm, I'm all for it. <laughs> That's my comment. I remember you sending me the pictures, Michael, texting me the pictures several times. I remember. And that's why you went, probably. With choice words. <laughs> um, okay, um, my two questions. Number one, Harry Waldo usually performs with his jazz uh, uh, band uh, on that side of, uh, of the uh, 
of the um, uh, the triangle there. Um, will that disrupt? I'm a big fan of Terry Waldo. He's one of the 34th Street and Bryant Park entertainers. Uh, will that uh, disrupt during the eight weeks that it's going to be present in any of the Terry Waldo performances, or will they find a, another close by space for Terry Waldo? Question number one, that would be for Rachel. Hold on a minute. Let me get the second one while I got it here. <clears throat> the second one, probably also for uh, Rachel, is having to do with money. I didn't see a lot of people going in. A couple of times that I went, it was kind of uh, uh, quiet. Um, how is the money? Uh, can you give me an overview of what's going on with the money? Is is the uh, 34th Street Partnership making a couple of bucks with this thing? Does the does the uh, event planner uh, make profit? Is it a profitable? I guess that's why they came back. It must be. Uh, can you can somebody talk to the money on this and to Terry Waldo? My two questions. Sure. So Terry Waldo first. Don't worry. We would never deprive anyone of, of the marvelous tunes of Terry Waldo. He will continue performing throughout the district this summer. Um, during this activation, he probably will be either in Herald or in Greeley Park. I think he was in the park a couple times during this inflatable last year, and the two could coexist. Um, so yeah, we will still have him around. Don't worry. Um, as for the money, yes. So the way that the subconcession agreement is structured through DOT, we basically charge rent to XL events for their use of the space. Um, and on top of that, we make a small percentage, uh, not even a percentage, just like a certain number of cents per ticket sold. Basically the deal is not structured for us to be rolling in cash as the bid. It's really intended for us to just have activity and visitation. Um, it's not a very aggressive deal on our part at all. Um, I do think that part of the reason uh, that, you know, we wanted to do it in one stretch this year is that last year, the breakup really did hurt ticket sales. And I think if you came in August, you probably saw really pretty good visitation. And if you came in October, you saw it pretty, you know, empty a lot or, you know, not all the way empty, but um, it was harder to get people there. So I know that um, part of the reason to change the timing is also for the the business of it to make sense because most of XL events costs are staff. Um, they have 24 hour security. They have lots of staff in and around the inflatable and those staff are there whether or not it's a busy day. So um, that's, that's the sense we got from them about, um, you know, what would have to change this year. Um, but I don't know if Alex, you want to elaborate on that at all? Um, yeah, no, um, I can just um, second what um, Rachel just said. Um, Obviously, um, you know, we're an events company, um, so, you know, we're doing this, um, you know, partially for um, the profit and partially because we love putting smiles on people's faces. Um, but, um, yeah, the eight week run, we're hoping that it will be a little more profitable um, so we can cover um, all the um, ongoing costs, including staffing and accommodations and um, stuff like that. Mike, does that answer your question? Good. Any other questions from the committee? Any questions from the public? We still have a few, a handful of people still on. Any questions? Okay, let's bring it back to uh, the committee in the business session. Um, given it's the same event, essentially the same events as last year, uh, I don't think we need to run this through the matrix. The only question that I have is to get the committee's feedback is timing having it at eight straight weeks instead of eight broken out weeks. Uh, Rachel and Alex have explained why uh, from a business perspective and uh, from an activation perspective, but I'm just curious to see the reaction of the committee. So David, you wanna start us off? Yeah, well, I do think eight, eight weeks is a long time, but I understand the breakup did not go well for them. And that uh, once they took it apart, then it was hard to rebuild the momentum they had. So seeing that they cut down from 12 weeks to eight weeks, uh, I'm, I'm for the event as it stands now. Does everybody, just in general, you don't have to raise your hand, but in, in general, is everybody thumbs up okay with the timing? Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other comments from the committee? Okay, uh, Samir or Catherine, do you, either of you wanna make a motion? 
I make a motion to move the 34th Street parking quick Excel balance event. Second. Okay. Uh, I'm a yes. David? Yes. Miriam? Yes. Catherine? Yes. John? Yes. Mike? Mike? Yes. Mike is done. Motion yes. And uh, Samir? Yes. The motion passes. So we'll get the resolution together uh, and uh, looking forward to seeing it. Have a great time and hopefully I will not have to rescue it. Five year old. <laughs> no, that's a good comment. We appreciate it. And thank you so much for your time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Okay. Uh, is there any new business? Any from either the public or from the committee? Quick question Is my microphone working? Yes. It, I can hear you perfectly now. Temperamental. You know, so, but no, it did come on. But you, were, you were fine when you spoke. Okay, uh, that being said, I think we can adjourn the meeting for this evening and uh, I will with each other either at other committee meetings or at the full board in a couple of weeks. Thank you everyone and have a good night.